right, here we go once again, guys. I have been so excited to get over to church this morning and talk to you about part five of Hell's Illusion. Thank you for being with me wherever you're looking uh, this morning on the Digital Cathedral from around the country and around the world. This has been a phenomenal series for me, and it is probably the most watched series that I have ever done on YouTube. I'm, I'm getting a lot of response, a lot of messages. Honestly, I'm blown away by how positive the responses have been. I, I expected a ton of pushback. I expected a lot of people to tell me that I'm a false teacher, heretic, leading people to the hell, <laughs> that I'm using it, saying it's an illusion. I haven't really got a lot of that. Oh, I've had, I've had my, uh, my share, but it hasn't been overpowering like I thought it would be. It's been very positive. And here's a phen phenomenal thing. A lot of you have said you know what, I've suspected this all of my life, that something was wrong, something was amiss, that this didn't make sense, but nobody talked about it, nobody taught about it, nobody brought anything to light. Well, I've kind of crashed the barrier, and if you're a Facebook person, since I started this series, I don't know if you've noticed how many Facebook posts from some really good guys are starting to come out of the closet now on this against this this terrible illusion called hell. We've spent four weeks on it. Last four weeks, we have shown that not only is this doctrine of hell unbiblical, absolutely unbiblical, it's absurd. <laughs> it's illogical. It's totally nonsensical. We, we've demonstrated that all of the references to hell in the scripture have come one of two ways. Either they're mistranslations or they're misinterpretations. Every single one of them We've shown that there was no, there was no word hell in Hebrew or Greek. It was St. Jerome who translated uh, into the Latin Vulgate from the Greek Septuagint that took liberty and pulled a word out of mythology called hell and plugged it into the Old Testament Sheol, which means simply grave or pit, New Testament corresponding Hades, grave or pit, and Gehenna garbage dump. Uh, we've, we've looked at those. We've, we've shown how th there, this is an illusion. It never was designed. It was man-made. It was brought into the Latin Vulgate, which became the standard Bible, the, you know, the, the standard, the, the level of all, everything else we had to measure. In fact, the, the King James, the Latin Vulgate, was the main source of use for background, for interpretation when... Um, when the Church of England bishops, and they were all Church of England bishops, that translated in, into the King James Version of the Bible, heavily influenced by the Latin Vulgate that was written by St. Jerome. And then Augustine, Augustine is the guy <clears throat> that took what Jerome said uh, was hell for the wicked, and Augustine then stretched it out. You know, here's where the church comes in, stretched it out and said, not only is hell for the wicked, it's for everybody that's not a Christian. So that's, that's when the door was really opened and it became a tool of evangelism. It became a, a tool of keeping converts, keeping people in suppression and fear, manipulation, control. So we've gone through all of that. The first four or five centuries, the New Testament church didn't teach this. There's no concept of it in the Old Testament at all. First four or five centuries, it was not taught by the New Testament church. And in fact, that's when they grew by leaps and bounds. And the good news, the absolute good news, spread all over the world like wildfire. And people, by the multitudes, were drawn to Jesus. So here's what I want to do today. We've spent four weeks on words and concepts and uh, mistranslations. So what I want to do uh, in the last two sessions, this week and next week, I want to highlight, apart from the mistranslations and the words that never appear in Hebrew or Greek, this morning I want to give you seven absurdities of the doctrine of hell that makes absolutely no sense if you just stop and think about it. And a man told me last week, and this was such a good testimony, he said, the only reason people believe in this is because they haven't thought it through. They haven't considered it. And we haven't considered it because the only alternatives we had were Calvinism and Arminianism, which both have hell, eternal conscious torment, as the very centerpiece of the message in theology. So this morning, I'm going to give you seven absurdities, apart from mistranslations, apart from a wrong word usage, 
Just seven absurdities of the doctrine of hell that make no sense when you think about it. All right, here's absurdity number one. Hell completely contradicts the loving, merciful, forgiving, and gracious nature of God. Hell absolutely contradicts the whole idea of it. The loving, merciful, forgiving, gracious nature of God. Let, let, me, let me give you one background scripture on this. Psalm chapter 136. Psalm 136. I'm going to read the first nine verses of Psalm 136. The whole concept of hell. We're looking at absurdity. Absurdity number one. If you're going to believe in hell, you're going to believe in something that totally contradicts the loving, merciful, forgiving, gracious nature of the Father. You're going to have to deny it. You're going to have to set it aside. And you're going to have to believe something totally irrational about the nature of God. Look what it says, Psalm 136. And uh, let me read the first nine verses. He says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Watch. For his mercy endures forever. Number one. Oh, give thanks to God, to the God of God's. Number two, his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of Lords. Number three, his mercy endures forever. To him alone who does great wonders, his mercy endures forever. To him whose wisdom is made the heavens. Number five, his mercy endures forever. To him who, him who laid out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun rules by day and his mercy endures forever. The moon by night and his mercy endures forever. Look, nine verses. And there's nine references to his mercy enduring forever. Now look, that psalm is 26 verses. 26 verses, 26 times David said God's mercy endures forever. 26 times he says mercy endures forever. You remember when we went back and we traced Gehenna, which is the only word Jesus ever used that was translated hell. How many times? Do you remember how many times Jesus used it? Twelve. And in one chapter, David uses mercy endures forever 26 times. I think, I think the scripture is trying to get a message across to us. The Bible says that God is love, right? That's the definition of God. God is love. Then David comes along and 26 times, 26 verses, he says his mercy endures forever. And then Paul said, wherever, wherever sin abounds, grace superabounds. Since, since God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, you know what? Then it's simply illogical to think that when you die, all of a sudden his nature and character changes. He changes from this one whose mercy endures forever, who's defined by love, who lets us know that you cannot out -sin grace, that somehow we all love him. But now we've had this concept, man, when you die, you're going to stand before God and he's going to judge your fanny. And you better just hope you catch him on a good day because I don't know. He's, you never know what God's going to do. How many times have you heard it? You just don't know what God's going to do. It would take a severe personality disorder to run from love, mercy endures forever, grace that goes beyond sin, over here to a tyrannical, maniac, torturer, <laughs> annihilator of humans. It would it, that's, the, that's the cosmic definition of bipolar. You'd have to believe that God is bipolar. You know, he has these wide mood swings. Over here, he swung way over to love and mercy and goodness and grace. Over here is all of a sudden when you die, his personality swings over here and he's ready to throw you into a customized torture chamber, literal flames of fire because you didn't measure, you didn't say, you didn't say the prayer quite right. You didn't really repent hard enough. Your heart really wasn't pure to the level that you can be in God's presence. You're out of here forever. Can you understand that if you're going to believe in hell, it totally contradicts the merciful, loving, gracious nature of God. God's character and hell are just totally irreconcilable. You cannot balance it out. It was Augustine who tried to take the Father's nature 
and twist it into something contrary to what Jesus reflected. Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So whenever, if you have a concept, you hear somebody teaching about a God or a Father that doesn't look like Jesus, you can just write it down, mark it, take it to the bank. He is not talking about your Father. He might be talking about a Molech type God or a Zeus type God. He's not talking about the Father. To try and make God's justice oppose His love is a convoluted reasoning beyond all comprehension, and that's what we do. I, I, I've had people tell me, you know, you teach grace and love and all that stuff. That's good. But you have to remember that God is justice. Like His justice is contrary. It's opposed to His love. Every trait of God flows out of one source. Every, everything of God flows out of the nature of love. In fact, justice, justice is about making things right. Justice is about setting things right. It's not about torture. Justice is not about torture. When you have a God of, of justice, you're saying he is a God that is about setting things right. He's about, a God about bringing things back into order, about re reconciliation and restoration. That's, what just, that's the purpose of justice. The justice system of the United States. Yes, there's correction. Yes, there can be discipline from the Father. But the end game of it is to bring us back and setting things right. It's not to destroy us and punish us forever. So, all right, here's absurdity number two. Absurdity number two is this. If you're going to believe in hell, then you have to also believe in a God that is fiendishly unjust and full of wrath, nothing like Jesus. That's absurd. It's absurd to believe in a father that is fiendishly unjust, full of wrath, and nothing like Jesus. If hell were a true doctrine, if hell were a biblical truth, then it would be the strangest and the most cruel type of justice you could ever conjure up in your mind. I, I did a Facebook post this week, and I asked on the Facebook post, I said, what crime, what wrong could anybody ever do, any human ever commit that the justice for that would be eternally tortured. Eternally tormented in flames of fire. What, what could anybody do that's bad enough that justice could only be served by an eternal torture? I, I, I find the most heinous crime individual, you know, Hitler always comes up. Well, are you trying to tell me about Hitler? Are you trying, Jeffrey Dahmer, those, those kind of names come up because we think, we don't think of our self-righteous self and our attitudes and our lies and the way we live our life. You know, we, we, we don't, we fail to see that every sin is the same to God. We teach it and preach it, but we don't really believe that. We believe a guy like Hitler, ain't no way he's gonna, well, even if Hitler killed six million people, does that equate to a justice of eternal conscious torture? At some point in time, justice has to be served, right? You can't, even in our justice system, we don't, we don't sentence a man to eternal prison. We, the longest sentence you can have is life. And then justice is served. So what, what, what is it? We would have to have a God, there, you know, no crime fits the punishment of eternal. None. At some point, it has to be resolved. If, if an all-knowing, all-powerful God who knows the end from the beginning, if he knowingly created billions of people, knowing ahead of time that they would suffer eternally as a payback for the short 70, 80, 90, 100 years that they were on earth, you know what? then that's not justice by any kind of demented standard that I could ever imagine. How could you make somebody suffer eternally for 70 years of bad choices? 70 years of spitting in the face of God. Does that deserve eternal torture? Come on, that's not justice. Justice is fair-mindedness. Justice is balanced and equal for everybody. The thrust of justice is to make things right. So ultimately, justice would hope. Justice would plan. Justice would make provision, no matter how many eons it might take. 
no matter how many, how many ages it would, it would require, it would, turn, it would continually turn up the dial of goodness and love in an increasing measure until every unbeliever would change their mind and respond to the revelation of everything that has been provided, everything that has been done for them by grace through love. I mean, Jesus started the process. Jesus, Jesus set things right for all humanity. That's, that's what he did. If you think the justice of God needs to be served, then Jesus served it. Jesus set all men right with God. He, he did what had to be done to make things just, to make things right. And in time, you will see what Jesus did as God's justice in action. Look what he did. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let's look at this. Verse 5. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. All right. Now here's Jesus beginning to set things right. Who being in the form of God did not consider to be robbed to be equal with God, right? That's his position. That's his identity. That's who he is. But here's what he did to make things right. He made himself of no reputation and he took upon him the form of a bondservant in coming in the likeness of men, all right? So he, he, he brought God and man together. The one who was equal with God, the one who was God, came and took on flesh. So what he's saying is, I'm, I'm going to bring everything together. I'm going to bring everything into rightness in myself. I'm going to represent this side and that side. This, this way, it, there, it, there can be no error. Jesus in himself took deity and humanity in one person. Right? It's called the hypostatic union. He was fully God, fully man. Everything was met from God and man in the one Jesus. And what was the purpose? To set everything right. Not, not on God's side, on man's side, to let us know we, we have been justified. We have been made just as if we have never sinned. We have been made justified. We are now perfect in God's eyes. That's what he did. So here's what he did. Made himself no reputation, took on the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance of the man. He humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of cross. Now, justice was served. Therefore, remember, you're in Christ. God has highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and those on earth and those that are under the earth. See, there is a recognition coming because Jesus set the record straight. Do you notice that he says, above earth, in the earth, and under the earth, all will come to a place where they recognize that Jesus is the Savior and Lord. Why? Because he has set things right for all men. Justice in Jesus has been fully served. So the second absurdity is very simply that you have to believe that God is fiendishly unjust, full of wrath, and nothing like Jesus, and not recognize that Jesus has set things right. He has fulfilled the justice. All right, number three. Number three. If you're going to believe in hell, you have to deny the sovereignty of God. Hell denies the sovereignty of God. Sovereignty means this. Sovereignty means supreme power and authority. That's what, that's what sovereignty is. There can only be one supreme authority and power. There can only be one. In Scripture, it states emphatically that it's God's express will to save all men. 1 Timothy chapter 2, I think we might have read this last week, a couple of these verses, but let me read it again. God says explicitly, so the sovereign will of God, the one who has all authority and all power, has said this this is my express will. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires, who has a will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between man, God and man, the, the man Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Who gave himself a ransom, a justifier, he gave himself a ransom for all, watch, to be testified in due time. That due time is being testified is now. This generation is finally testifying to the will that, is, that God has to save all men 
and that Jesus has already paid the ransom, paid the price. He's justified all of us. Right? Now, uh, when we read those verses, I got to ask you something. I got to ask you something. These verses make hell a slap in the face of the Father who through the Son has not only been seeking us, but has also been saving us. He's been saving us when we didn't even realize He's been saving us. He's been seeking us at times we didn't even realize He was seeking us. Man's will and the pull of the traducer is no match for the pull of the Father. Do you remember last week I read to you John chapter 12, verse 32, that says, No man comes to me unless the Father, hell quote, drags him. It says draw, but the word is actually drags. See, if you're going to believe in hell, you have to deny the sovereignty of God's will and you have to believe in the sovereignty of man's will. Sovereignty does what is ever necessary to get the job done and nothing can withstand the sovereign will of God. When God says, when you, when you read the word, all of you word mechanics, when you read the word and it says God's will, God says, this is my will. You can take it to the bank that at some point in time, his will will be done. His will is the sovereign supreme will. It is God's will that none perish, but that all come to repentance. If that's God's will, then God's will will be done. God desires that all men, God wills that all men be saved. We just read it out of Timothy. If that's God's will, that's God's plan, it will be done. So what we've done through this doctrine of hell, this illogical, absurd doctrine, we have made God into this weak, powerless, impotent being who cannot fulfill his own will with his own creation. We have in fact, in fact said, in effect said that the creation is greater than the creator. That the will of the creation supersedes the will of the creator. How crazy can you get? How crazy can you be? There is only one who's totally sovereign, who has a completely sovereign will, fr totally free will, and baby, it ain't you. Hate to tell you that. It's not you, it's him. We have a measure. We can make choices. We are in, in parameters. It's metra. We have a measure. But he is the sovereign will of the universe and his will will be done. All right, absurdity number four. If you're going to believe in hell, apart from the mistranslation of words, words being interjected, uh, all, all the things that we've already covered, number four, hell negates the gospel of Jesus. Hell negates the gospel of Jesus. What is the gospel? John knew what the gospel was. Here's the, here's the gospel. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 14. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 14. Look at this. Whosoever drinks of the water that I, I bring. John chapter 4 verse 14. Whosoever drinks of the water I sh shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I give him. It's not, that's not 414, is it? Yeah, oh, for, I'm sorry, 1 John 4.14. It got, it's got a big Roman numeral 1 in front of it. I knew we, we had a little problem here. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 14. Watch. Here's the gospel. Then we'll go to big John. But let's, let me hit this 1 John first. John says, we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son, here's the gospel, as the Savior of the world. So who is he the Savior? He's the Savior of the entire world. That's the gospel. Now let's go to 1 John chapter 4. Let's go to big John. And John had such a revelation about this that it was mind-blowing. John chapter 4, and let me start with verse 30. Let me start with verse 39. John chapter 4, verse 39. Here we go. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in Jesus because of the, of the word of the woman who testified that he told me everything that I ever did. So the Samaritans had come to him and urged him to stay with him, and he stayed with them two days. And many of them believed on Jesus because of his word. Watch what they said. Here's their testimony. They said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, 
and know that he is indeed the Christ, watch, the Savior of the world. Now that's, that, that my brothers and sisters, is the good news, right? It's, it's the glad time. Remember when the angels announced the coming of Jesus? They said, the Savior is coming and he's here and it will be glad tidings of good news to all men. It embraces everybody. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense for Jesus. Come on, we're, we're, we're not talking about mistranslated words. We're not talking about uh, doctrines that have worked their way. We're talking about just thinking reasonably. It doesn't make sense for Jesus to be called in the scripture the savior of the world if he's going to lose the 90% of the population. Does it? Does that compute with you? Doesn't make any sense. Religion has downplayed the gospel and has, has magnified and glorified a non-existent mythological word interpreted hell in the fourth century to retain people and evangelize people. This doctrine makes no sense and it fully negates the full, pure gospel good news. It is the biggest detractor of good news that man could have ever invented. And it has worked well to keep us under control. But brother, we're coming out from under the wraps. We're coming out from under the control. Number five, here's, here's the fifth thing that is ridiculous. It's ludicrous. It's absurd. The fifth absurdity is this. Hell ignores, it twists, and explains away all of the scriptures that give eternal hope for all men. And the Bible is full of scriptures that's full of hope for everybody. And yet this doctrine of hell makes us look at those verses and say, yeah, but, or only if, or, but you must first, right? Religion teaches us to look at the Bible as a behavior manual. Most Christians that I know read this book to find out what to do, what not to do. It becomes a guide for behavior modification, doesn't it? Well, you know, the Bible says you shouldn't do that. Well, the Bible says you better do that. Well, the Bible says you better act this way. Well, the Bible says be holy because he's holy. You better act holy. And so we're going to make up some things to help you to act holy. You better get those earrings off. You better not wear jewelry. Better not wear makeup. You better not go to the movies. Better not dance. Better not, better not, better not. Why? Because we read in here, we try to make this thing into a behavior man manual to modify our behavior because we don't want to go to hell. And it totally, it totally overlooks all of the verses in here that were written under inspiration to give us hope. So it becomes a manual for behavior modification rather than a book of grace, rather than it being a letter of love from a father to his family to, to, to inspire us. Help us see that he looks at us and says, your beloved sons and daughters in whom I'm well pleased. That's what this book is written for. There are dozens and dozens of scriptures that transcend our ability to do. There's lots of scriptures that go way beyond our ability to adhere. And we just have to say, he did it as us and he did it all. Let, let, me, let me give you one passage of scripture that has eight alls in it. And there's nothing in here that you do. It's what he has done for us. But when we come to this doctrine of eternal conscious torment, we try to explain all of this away. Because it just can't be that good. It just can't be that inviting. And the only reason we say that is because of the background that we've come through that has made the good news into bad news. All right, watch this. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, I'm going to read five verses, 15 through 20. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. And if you have your Bible, I want you to circle all the alls in here. Verse 15. He is the image and invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. All right, he's the prototype. He's the firstborn. We all came out of that pattern, right? Verse 16. For by him... All things were created that are in heaven and are on earth, whether the thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. All things were created through him and for him. For he is before all things, and in him 
All things consist. You cannot get outside of him. In him, everything consists, right? So when we come along with this crazy doctrine of hell, we can't, we can't say everything consists in him because you can't consist in him until you're good enough, until you earn your way into that position. And then he comes along and says, I've been trying to tell you guys, this is the way I set it up. This is the way I brought it into being. I made him the firstborn over all creation so you could look at him and see what I think about you. And I put you all in him. In him, everything consists. This is so good. He is the image of the invisible God. Firstborn over all creation. You got it? Verse 18. And he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth, things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Do you know how many alls there are in there? I counted them this week. There's eight. In those verses 15 to 20, that's verses 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, in six verses, he gives us eight alls. Now listen. If you believe in hell, you don't believe any of those verses. Or you got to try to explain them away some way. And that's what we did as Armenians. That might my background. We would explain all those away with something like this. Well, that only applies to Christians. That those verses only apply to believers. No, that's not what, there's nothing in there about what you did. There's nothing about you believing or there's nothing about your part accomplished. It's all about what he did. That includes everybody. So listen, if you have a choice of believing in a word and a concept that doesn't even exist in Scripture, <laughs> if you have the choice in believing in a concept, a word that doesn't even believe in Scripture, or you have the choice of believing in a passage that contains eight inclusive alls that encompass everybody. I go with the passage that has the eight alls in it that includes everybody and it excludes the concept of a word that doesn't even exist in the Bible. If you're going to believe in hell, then you have to you have to not believe in all of the verses that give us hope and that are good news. Let me, let me just give you a couple. You, you got to say, well, you know, that, that doesn't apply. I can't really believe that. John chapter 1, verse 29. John, the next day, saw Jesus coming. And he looked at Jesus, pointed Jesus. Right there he is, guys. Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Well, did he or didn't he? Well, that's just, you know, you got to accept it. You have to receive it. You have to believe it. No, that's not what it says. It says that's what he did. But because you're looking at the scripture through the skewed lens of a word that never exists, but has been tagged on and mistranslated and misinterpreted, you got to explain away good news like that. You can't just stand back and say, I embrace that he's taken away all of my sins because he was the lamb. No, you can't do that. You got to confess it. You got to pray it. You got to believe it for yourself, right? 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. In case that didn't ring the bell, here we go. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. If you believe in hell, all this has got to be negated. You can't, you've got to explain all this away. 1 John 2, 2. And he is the of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the entire world, saying the same thing John 1, 29 did. He is the propitiation, the place taker of, of not only our sins, not just me, the goody, goody guy, the sin of the entire world, man. All right, watch this. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. Let me back up just a little bit to the left. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 9. Paul says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. All right? Now, is, is there an advantage to believing? Absolutely. This is how, believing is how, 
It, believing is a response to revelation. That's what believing is. You don't, you don't have a believer that you can whip up. <laughs> believing is a natural response when you see revelation. All right? Is there an advantage to believing? Absolutely. Believing, responding, is what walks us into the abundant life that we can enjoy, that Jesus came to bring us, but it has nothing to do with saved. He is the Savior of all men. All men are saved. Especially of those of us who believe. We recognize it. We're enjoying it, man. We're reveling in the salvation, but it has nothing to do with all men being saved. Because they are. But if you believe it, if you've got it, if you've seen the revelation of it, man, it's joyous. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a freeing experience to believe. All the weight is taken off. So how can he, 1 John chapter 4, verse, what is it, 11, 10? How, how can he be the Savior of all men? How can he be the Savior of all men? How, how, how is that possible? And not save everybody, but lose most of us to hell. How can that even be reasonable? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. Let's, let's keep reading, because you've got to explain all these away. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 22. Watch. As in Adam die, all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Well, you know, we all died in Adam, but you've got to believe to be in Jesus. So you've got to explain it away. You just can't take it at face value. You can't just say, wow, that's amazing. That's good news. Nothing I did on that one. But to each one in his own order, it says in verse 23, the first part. So we all come in at different times. We come in at different ways. But it doesn't negate the fact that everybody that died in Adam was made alive in Christ. See, y'all are universalists when it comes to Adam. You're willing to put everybody into first Adam. But when it comes to Jesus, you want to get selective. You know why? Because that's what you were taught. You were taught Calvinistically or Arminiacally, if I could say that. You were taught through Arminianism and Calvinism that you had to come in by their theological formula. And that was the only right formula. All right? Romans chapter 5, verse 8. You've got to explain that away when it clearly says, Adam all died, Christ all made alive. Last Adam. All right. Now watch this. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, he died for us. Verse 10. For if when we were enemies, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life, not by my confession. Not by my belief. We're saved by his life. We were reconciled when we were enemies. And we were saved then much more by his life. See, God just got rid of all of his enemies. You know how God got rid of all of his enemies? He made us all sons. That's how God got rid of his enemies. He made us all sons. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 13 tells us that at one point in time, everyone above the earth, in the earth, and under the earth will end up in a place where they are praising and worshiping God. Is anyone not in the group of above heaven, in the earth, or under the earth? Is there anybody that's any place other than above the earth, in the earth, or under the earth? Can you be any place else? No, that includes everybody. All right, now these last two is, are the two that really bug me. They are so absurd. Number six, hell encourages a spirit of unforgiveness, prejudice, and revenge toward other people. Do you know what the root of all doctrinal disputes is? Let me say that again. If you're going to believe in hell, I can tell you right now, you hold unforgiveness, prejudice, and revenge toward other people. You look at other people and you think they're not forgiven. You look at other people, you say, well, they haven't come through the hoops that I've come through. I'm saved. I'm not sure about them. Right? You, do you know the root of doctrinal disputes? You know why we have 40,000 denominations in it? You know why there's divisions? All of the divisions are, we're in, you're out. We're right, you're wrong. We're saved, you're lost. It comes from a fear that we have got to get it right. And if we don't get it right, 
If we're not saved and we haven't accepted him the way that I believe we should, I have a chance that I might spend eternity being unmercifully tortured for my error. So I have got to get this right. So we defend to the death the ideas and the concepts and the doctrines that are totally contrary, absolutely diametrically opposed to the life of Jesus and the Father that he reflected out of fear of being wrong and the potential consequences of being tormented. And so we judge other people wrong because it enforces how right we are. That's why we got 40,000 denominations that all out of fear want to get it right for themselves to the exclusion of other people. Well, you know those old Catholics, they're not saved. You know those Catholics over there, they pray to, they pray to saints and they have this thing about, they're not, they don't have like, we, how about them United Pentecost? Oh my gosh. United Pentecost, so they believe that you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus only or you're not saved. United Pentecostal would say, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Now see, you good Baptist, you'd argue with them on that. And you good United Pentecostal, you would argue with the Baptist about once saved, always saved. You know why? Because you're fearful. You're fearful that if you're not right, that you might go to hell. So you will defend to the nth degree your little petty doctrines to the exclusion of other people. You won't look at Scripture that embraces everybody. You won't look at the Scriptures like we read about Jesus is the Savior of all. You won't look at Him being the Savior of the world. No, no, no. you got your little party going on and you're a United Pentecostal. We speak in tongues and we were baptized in the name of Jesus only. Them Catholics, those Baptists, those Lutherans and Presbyterians, they're going to hell, but we got it right. See, we have the corner on truth and the salvation formula that we have. We will defend it to the nth degree because we can't afford to be wrong. Do you understand that? Do you see that why people argue doctrine? They can't be wrong. Now, let me come every Sunday. Let me come every Sunday to church so you can confirm how right I am, how right we are, and how wrong them guys are. 90% of the people go to church every Sunday to get a reaffirmation of what they already believe. They want a, they want a continual biased message and teaching that makes them feel secure and good about themselves and to hell with everybody else. That's the attitude. Now, if they want to come in our church and join, you know, that, there's plenty of room they can come in. But the way the United Pentecostals, the way those Baptists, the way those Presbyterians are going, I'm telling you what, they've missed God, they're going to hell. All right, that's, that's just absolutely absurd. Forget the mistranslated words. Forget the Bible doesn't prove hell. Forget the fact there's no hell in the Bible. Just that doctrine of you believe in hell makes you that kind of person. Number seven. Hell believing people have no answers for three questions. If you believe in hell, here's a question. Question number one. How can a just God cast billions of people into hell that died without hearing the gospel. How can, it, how, how can God do that? Now I've heard some explanations. Crazy answers. Here's what I've heard. Well, just before everybody dies, they get a flash of revelation and they can make a choice. I've heard that one a lot. I've heard this one. Well, you know, Romans says that you can see God's handiwork in all of nature. So everybody's had a chance in our are without excuse because you can see God everywhere and in everything. Well, are you a pantheist that believes God's... No, I'm not a pantheist. But you can see God's handiwork, so you're without excuse. All kinds of crazy answers. The truth is, he can't send multitudes to hell that have never heard the gospel because there is no hellfire to torture or throw them into. That's why he can't do it. All right, question number two. If you're a hell believer, I got a question for you. 
How can God cast a 12-year-old girl into hell who heard the gospel at vacation Bible school, understood it, but didn't respond? And on the way home, she dies in a car wreck. How can God do that? Well, brother, you know, she reached the age of accountability. The age of accountability is a demonic doctrine that brings fear to our children at the earliest age possible, forcing them to make an emotional decision to escape being eternally burned in fire. That's why I did. I can't, I, I always say it was, I was 10. I, I was younger, actually, I'm sure than that. I think I actually understood the gospel at seven or eight years old because I heard it a lot. So are you telling me that at seven or eight, understanding the gospel, that Jesus died for my sins, that I had to make a prayer, I had to receive him into my life as my personal Lord and Savior. If I didn't do that, I was lost. I understood that at seven or eight. So you're telling me that if I, I caught a disease or I died in an accident, that God's going to take that seven or eight-year-old boy and throw him into an eternal without end torture? Are you, are you, is that, well, 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 I, I mean, I, well, I, you know, God looks at the heart. No, 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 wait a minute. You're telling me that nobody goes to heaven without Jesus making him the Lord of your life. That eight-year-old boy did not do that, and he understood. Well, well, look, that's a damnable doctrine. If you're a good Calvinist, you even believe that God sends babies to hell for his glory. That God gets great joy and glee. Watch a John Piper video. Watch John MacArthur videos. They will tell you that God gets great glory from watching people suffer forever. Even children, because they were predestined to go there. Question number three. How, how could we ever enjoy heaven knowing that our children or our grandchildren are being tortured forever? How could you ever enjoy heaven? Again, I've heard some crazy stuff like, well, well, when you get to heaven, you're not going to have any memory of those people. But then out of the other side of our mouth, we're saying, well, when we get to heaven, we're going to see Aunt Sally. We're going to see Grandma. What a joyous time. But then on the other end, you say, well, we don't remember those people if they're in hell. I've heard crazy stuff like you won't remember them. I've heard crazy stuff like, well, God's ways are not our ways. How about this one? Well, we'll understand it better by and by. Hi, oh yeah, we will. It's okay. We're in heaven. They're being tortured forever. We'll understand it all better. But that is just plain El Toro poo poo. I don't know how else to say it. The, those three questions, if you're a hell believer, you can't be very honest with yourself. To be a hell believer, not only do you have to believe in a mythology, a mistranslation and a replacing of words in Scripture. But you have to cling to absurdities and ideas that make absolutely no sense, especially in the light of love himself. And I'm glad today that I'm part of a generation, and I don't mind being out on the end of the spear and replacing all these traditions and doctrines of bad news and false doctrine that have pervaded. Let me say it again. There's no bad news in the good news. How can it be good and believe someone's going to be burning in flames forever? That's, there's no part of that that's good. The doctrine of hell is not only unbiblical, it's absurd. It's illogical. It's nonsensical. It's an invented pagan doctrine that needs to be kicked out of every church in America and around the world. Now, Wednesday night, don't miss. Because we're going to be answering the question that many have asked. What about the unpardonable sin? How do, how do we deal with that? Let's talk about that on this coming Wednesday night. God bless you. Hope you got something out of this. That's six down, five down, one more to go. And we're going to hit it from another angle next Sunday morning as we wrap up this series on Hell's Illusion. Share the, vid, share the teaching. Be bold. You, you might get some pushback. <laughs> Understand it. But if you feel 
that this resonates with you, then be bold and share it. We need to let people know that they are free from the flames and the torment of a false doctrine. God bless. See you Wednesday night, next Sunday at the Digital Cathedral.